Jesus told his disciples a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will you not both fall into the pit? No disciple is superior to the teacher, but when fully trained, every disciple will be like his teacher. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove that splinter in your eye when you do not even notice the wooden beam in your own eye? You hypocrite, remove the wooden beam from your eyes first, then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not pick figs from thorn bushes, nor do they gather grapes from brambles. A good person out of the store of goodness in his heart produces good. But an evil person out of a store of evil produces evil. For from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. Hello and welcome to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father By, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. An evil person. Wow. I, I, I know some bad people. And I, I really do. But few are the people that I consider evil. And believe it or not, they are out there. One of the things that I think has been downplayed in the post-Vatican Church is the reality of evil. You know, when I was a kid, it was even in the cartoons. You know, when someone's trying to make a decision, you got a little devil on one shoulder, you got a little angel on one shoulder. You know, the devil's got the tail and the pitchfork and the angel's got the little halo. You know, do the right thing, do the wrong thing. One of the things that I remember very vividly after the Second Vatican Council was people saying, the devil's not real. The devil is just the presence of evil or poor choices in the world. And for those of us of a certain age, we will remember the old sitcom thing with Flip Wilson, you know, the devil made me do it, of doing something bad or whatever. And I think people have depersonalized the reality of the devil, the reality of evil. One of the things that I think most people don't want to hear and don't want to believe is the fact that there has been a huge increase in recent years in the exorcism school in the Vatican. Yeah, we train exorcists. Not from the movie with the pea green suit projectiles, okay? But we train exorcists these days. Because the reality of evil and the exposure to evil has pretty much become worldwide. And when you live in a world and I want you to think about this. I want you to think very carefully. When you live in a world 
where someone actually goes to jail for being cruel to pets, whether it's puppies, kittens, horses, whatever. Someone goes to jail for that. And then on the other hand, we have people vowing, and in light of this recent decision in New York, to be able to inject and kill a full-term baby. There's evil in the world. There is absolutely evil. Murder is murder, but we don't consider deer hunting murder. Why? Because animals don't have souls. But now we're saying these animals that don't have souls, we can go to jail for cruelty, but we can ki kill a full-term baby. You tell me there's not evil in the world? You tell me there are not evil forces in the world? For God's sakes, quit burning your bra and wake up. That there is a reality. To say to kill a baby is woman's health care, but to mistreat a puppy is inhumane. There's evil in the world. There absolutely is. And my diocese does not have an exorcist that I'm aware of. Because, you know, no one hangs out the sheet, you know, a shingle saying, I'm the exorcist. But I'm not aware of our diocesan exorcist. But I have met them. I met some from the Northeast. I met some from the, from, from the West Coast. And talking to them about demonic possession or demonic obsession is very, very real. In years gone by, we have referred those behavior issues to the psychiatric community who's all but punted on them and says, we, you know, we don't know what to do. We medicate them and keep them from hurting themselves and hurting anybody else. And many of these people are institutionalized. And I'm going to tell you about a lady that for three years I dealt with. And she was actively hallucinating in my office, identifying herself as bipolar, dealing with the fact that I have my doctorate in pastoral counseling. She thought I could help her. And we talked. She's been on medication for over 20 years. The marriage failed. The job market failed. The family alienation took place. And we talked every couple months for about three years. She came in, and one day she'd come in just as clear as a bell, making perfect sense, and come in the next time as disconnected as anybody you wanted to see, and that's when the active hallucination was going on. After about uh, two, three years, and listening to the ups and downs of medication, the treatment, da 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 so let me tell you something. I don't know if your problem is psychological or spiritual. We have a priest in the diocese. He works very closely with the charismatic community. He does dealing with past histories and this, that, and the other. And it's going to be some work. But I'd like for you to see him. Because when you're on... You make as much sense to anybody as I ever know. When you're off, you're off, okay? You're really off. So she engaged in a six-month process with this priest. I don't know the process. She came back about three months after she had finished dealing with the priest. Reemployed, off of the medication she had taken for 20 years, made great sense. 
She hasn't followed up with me. There is such a thing as an exposure and availability to demonic forces in our life. The reality of evil and the personification of the devil is real. And, you know, there's so many people, and many of these people have committed suicide out of sheer desperation. Others are over-medicated and living in state institutions. But when we don't know and we just think everything is crazy, don't limit your help to the psychiatric community. I'm not at all disparaging good psychiatric help because it's helped many people. I want you to understand that it is real and sometimes, all the time, the spiritual can be much more powerful than the medical. That's not saying someone who actively is uh, psychotic and needs medication just needs to pray more. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when you find difficulty finding hope, finding help in the psychiatric community, there's some investigation in the spiritual community that can be of great value. And make no mistake about it, the power of God is much stronger than the power of evil. And there have been, through the generations and families, evil people. And some people have experienced some of that evil, not necessarily embraced it, but been experiences of it. And so, please understand, evil is real. The devil is real. In the Vatican, the school of exorcism is growing exponentially because there are many, many situations that the psychiatric community, as well as the medical, the chemical medical community, are not able to deal with. Maybe it's a combination, maybe it's either or. I really don't know. But I think it's at our own peril that we dismiss the reality of evil in the world. And so that's what I'm inviting everyone to realize. When our Lord talks about our own hypocrisy and that sort of thing, sometimes we just don't understand what goes on. Sometimes we don't understand the whys. Oftentimes in addiction, you sit down with someone, and I've sat with addicts, and they said, I don't want to do drugs. I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't like what I do. I know I'm dishonest. I know I've stolen from my parents. I'm ashamed of what I do. I know I've lied to you. I know I've lied to this. You know, some of this stuff really goes together. It's not either or, but it's at our own peril that we think we're the masters of our universe. When we discount the power of God in our healing, and when we discount the power of God for overcoming aberrant behavior, we're not looking honestly at what's possible. If any of you are in 12-step recovery, you know the first thing they tell you, the first step, they call it a higher power. Without God, I'm powerless. Whether it's for aberrant behavior or daily behavior, without God, we're powerless, and he does have a foe, and it is the devil, and we are called to recognize both. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bayou from Close to Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today, and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that would is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, 
The truth is in great demand and in very short supply. And mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly, we all realize that when this life journey is over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court. We stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove that splinter from your eye when you do not even notice a wooden beam in your own eye? You hypocrite. Remove the wooden beam from your eye first, then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. Hello and welcome back to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. Forty years ago, when I was ordained a priest, one of the readings from our nation was from the book of Hebrews. And it's talking about the priest being able to deal patiently with erring sinners, for he himself is beset with weakness. If there's anything I would like to be remembered as, as a priest, would not be this television show. I'd like to re be remembered as a very compassionate confessor although my ability to sometimes be blunt, in case you haven't noticed, my ability to be blunt sometimes affects people in confession. But that's what I would like to, to be able to do, is in confession and counseling, be able to be seen as compassionate and caring. And yeah, I get it. I understand. And one of my best reminders for confession is my own willingness on a monthly basis to go to confession. And when I go to confession every month, and I go to a really good friend of mine, and to sit down and talk about where I've fallen short, uh, it reminds me. It reminds me of my own sinfulness. It reminds me of my own fault and failings. And if that doesn't do it, I got three older brothers who remind me of it every time I see them, okay? But anyway, being aware of our own sins, our own faults, our own failings. One of the things that the post-Vatican Church has resulted in, and, and I, I'm ashamed that some people were, were catechized this way. Oh, you don't need to go to confession all the time. Only go if you got mortal sins. Well, if the confession line became known for only mortal sinners, who's going to go stand in line? Not me. Not me. But telling somebody that you don't have to go to confession unless you have mortal sin is like telling someone you don't go to the doctor until you get a terminal disease. Makes no sense. And the idea that by and large the sacrament of reconciliation has not been very prevalent in our Catholic practice means that people don't look at themselves often. Mom used to say, a leopard never sees his own spots, okay? 
Well, if every month you go to confession, gee whiz, you see nothing but spots, right? If you take once a month to sit down and say, okay, what kind of husband, wife, son, daughter, brother, sister, mother, father, co-worker am I? If we take that amount of time every month to look at our lives, examine our conscience, and see whether or not we're being and becoming the person that Christ has in store for us to become, you know what? We got so much to work on with ourselves, we don't have time to look at other people's faults. The people who are only there to be critical of others. You know what, baby? Somebody needs to get you a mirror for Christmas. That's what you need. Look at your own self. Look at your own faults, your own failings. And our Lord's talking about the splinter and the wood beam. Okay? Oh, yeah. These people this, these people that, these people that. Get a mirror. Get an examination of conscience. Look at your own lives. Look at your own sins. Am I a hypocrite? Guilty. Intentionally? No. Am I hypocritical? No. Do I want to be hypocritical? No. Do I end up talking a lot better than I actually live? Yeah, I do. I'd love to tell you, you know, I'm as prayerful as you can ever be. I'm as holy as you can ever be. I am as, as kind and non, non-judgmental and patient. Traffic's another issue altogether, okay? As patient as I can ever be, I'm not. I'm not. But I'm working on it. I am working on it. And I think most of us, if we took time to look at ourselves very honestly, we would realize how far we have to go to be pleasing in the sight of God. People oftentimes say, you know, Father, you keep talking about developing a prayer life. You keep talking about praying more, asking God. I got a very simplistic method. Why? Basically, because I'm not that complicated. But you want to develop a prayer life? Don't ask for the right book on prayer. You know, don't ask to see who the spiritual fathers are and that sort of thing. You want to learn how to pray? Every morning, take the first 10 minutes. Get a cup of coffee. Go sit. Not with the rosary, not with a Bible, not with the Catholic book of devotions. Sit down for 10 minutes. I got this today. I got that today. I'm going here. I'm going there. At work, we got to do this. With the kids, I got to do that. The spouse is asking to do this. The neighbors are asking to do that. Take 10 minutes. And invite God to be part of all those situations. You know, Henry Nouwen once said, people complain about the distractions and their prayers until they realize that the distractions are their prayers. If I'm worried about this and I'm trying to pray, that's where God wants me to be invited. Invite me into that meeting. Invite me in to deal with that person who's such a pain in the you-know-what. Invite me to all those situations. Take 10, 10 minutes. You and God plan your day. God, give me the grace to hold my tongue and not say what I'm thinking in that meeting because I've had it up to here with those people. Pray for that. That's prayer. I'm inviting God to walk through the day with me. Night prayer? Go online. Google. Active, uh, uh, not active contrition, excuse me, examination of conscience. Google the examination of conscience and find one that really speaks. Print it out. Put it next to your bed. 
Before you go to bed, take 10 minutes. Go through it. Did I do this? Did I do that? Did I not do this? Did I not do that? Evaluate your day. Look at the things you did right. Look at the things you did wrong. Make a good act of contrition and go to bed. You do that on a daily basis, you'll have to go to confession once a month. Why? Not because you've committed mortal sins, because I don't want to commit mortal sins. I don't want to have a terminal disease. That's why I go to the doctor for a checkup. I try to do the things that I'm supposed to do because I don't want these bad things to happen. Spiritually, I don't want these bad things to happen. That's why I do what I do. And the idea of being very judgmental and condemning other people, the acts are right or wrong. There is objective morality. But it's not up to you, me, or anyone else to pass out tickets to heaven or hell. It's up to us to understand the person, invite the person to repentance, invite the person back to God. Again, we enter into their story, we understand. You know what? If I'd have been raised like that, if those people had been my parents, if that had happened to me when I was a child, if those things had happened to me, I don't know where I'd be today. I promise you, I don't know where I would be today if I had been raised in that environment and thought this was right, saw no problem with it. I don't know where I'd be if I lived in a neighborhood growing up and violence and people getting shot was part of what happened to me walking home from school every day. I don't know whether or not I'd be carrying a gun at the age of 12. In the seminary, I ran a pool hall for adjudicated delinquents, 8 to 13. The rule was I had to collect guns before they came to play pool. They couldn't have their guns and play pool, 8 to 13 years old. Why? Because they had to walk home at night. They didn't, you know, these kids didn't want to kill anybody. These kids didn't want to be killed. And if something happened, these kids had to be, they, they, they had to be armed. This is 40 years ago. I don't know where I'd be today. Don't judge. Be an ear. Be a friend. Invite them back to God. Invite them back to holiness. We can do it when we're painfully aware of our own sins, our own faults, our own failings. But until we can look at ourselves in the mirror, in the mirror that God provides for us, it's pretty easy to go around condemning and judging. Don't do it. That's not what God wants of us. That's not what we want from God. Thank you for being with us today. May each day bring you closer and you walk with the Lord. God bless you.